All right, it is now time for Intersection, and today we're going to focus on the death of O.J. Simpson. Meeting at the Intersection tonight, Mark Saunders of Mark Saunders Consulting and former police chief of uh, Toronto, and also law lawyer Ari Goldkind and Steve Futterman, a reporter who covered uh, O.J. and his trial, all three of his trials, that is. Okay, gentlemen, thanks for being here. Let me jump into this news. Uh, first off, everybody's reactions, what their first thought was when they heard O.J. was dead. Mark, we'll start with you. Yeah, it, it reminded me of exactly where I was uh, when the car chase happened. And I, too, was just gravitated by watching that trial. Um, as a police officer, and as a young police officer, I was actually working in the fugitive squad at the time. Um, I was watching it through a police lens. And, um, you know, it, it was interesting because it, for the first time, I was watching people playing the camera as well as listening to the evidence. And it was really unbelievable how at the end of the trial uh, it caused such a, a large divide between uh, the black community and and the rest uh, because of the the outcome which came right at the heels of the um, Rodney King uh, trial so it was the sum of all parts that created that atmosphere for that conclusion I think and it, again it is something that has caused that infamy for OJ Simpson and a tragic for uh, Nicole Kidman and for, for Ron Goldman. Hmm. Okay, Ari, uh, and we're going to talk more about race uh, in a moment, but, but Ari, your, your initial reaction. Travis, I was delighted when I heard he died. He is one of the worst and most rotten human beings that ever has walked the face. He has gotten a pass from millions of people simply because he's famous and runs through airports and played in the NFL. He literally wrote the book on how to get away with murder. You'll recall many years ago, Robert Shapiro, his lawyer, who knew the truth about OJ after the jury verdict, said a very famous line that he played the race card from the very bottom of the deck, just like Mark, and I'm old enough to remember where I was during the Bronco police chase in my late grandparents' home when the NBA game was interrupted and Larry King uh, who, what we all remember, if you're my age, talked us through it. And I remember being in law school, going over to a local bar and watching the verdict and literally not understanding. This is before I was even political, Travis. Yeah. Not understanding how people in the streets of L.A. were celebrating his acquittal. Whether or not you believe there was a problem with the LAPD or not, they were celebrating and jumping for joy, as Gloria Allred mentioned, a woman who he had terrorized and who had predicted would kill her and get away with it, mm -hmm. he decapitated her and they're celebrating. So to close my answer of how I feel, he brought Lou Brown, uh, he brought the family of uh, Fred Goldman, he made them live through hell. I hope he's in the hell that he made them live through for decades. Okay, uh, we always know where you stand, Ari. Uh, Steve Futterman, I, I, you know, you were covering this trial. I wonder what you thought today, what kind of memory this took you back to about that time period and what everything was like. Well, Travis, I've actually been thinking about this for the last week because a week ago, almost at this time, I was contacted by a source who said that Simpson was in near death. I did not was not able to confirm that, so never mm -hmm. reported it, but uh, did contact CBC News, so uh, we were prepared for it uh, when it happened. So uh, my first reaction was, gee, gee, that source was right. But obviously, this brings back uh, so many memories. Simpson was so much a part of my life. I actually covered the Rodney King trial before that. So I do know how that played a role in how the jury and how the prosecution and how the defense arguments were, were really received by the jury. The Rodney King trial did play a role in this. I think most people agree race was an issue, celebrity was an issue, economic power was an issue. There were so many things. And yes, that, that slow speed chase is one of the most bizarre things I've ever seen. As people were jumping down, uh, it was almost the, the, the ultimate anti-hero moment in uh, the modern North American media history with people cheering a man who at that time was being accused of killing his wife ex-wife and Ron Goldman. And, and Steve, just remind us, uh, and, and then we'll go back to, to Mark here, yep. but remind us uh, how big of a star O.J. was when, uh, when this news came out. He was on cereal boxes, uh, you know, he had commercials. Uh, listen, we knew him as a football player, but I'll tell you how, how the, the, the barometer for O.J. Simpson being a celebrity. It was Hertz, the Hertz commercial. 
before O.J. Simpson and a bit before Bill Cosby. He did the Jell-O commercial. This was in 1974. There had never really been a black celebrity, a black person who was well known, who was taken on as a as a spokesperson for a major corporation. Hertz felt that his connection to whites and blacks was so powerful that he, they used him as their their main spokesman. He broke that glass ceiling. And there was a, one comment made, uh, made uh, supposedly, he said many times over the years, I'm not black, I'm OJ. And that, to some degree, that was true. People didn't view him as black or white. He was just accepted as a star. Now, we later saw that with other politicians, other celebrities. Uh, they weren't viewed as black or white anymore. But he was really one of the first, if not the first, celebrity that broke through that barrier who was not viewed as, oh, he's black or, oh, he's white. He was O.J. Simpson, and that barrier with Hertz was quite remarkable. Which is, which is a really interesting point, Mark, that I want to put to you. You know, he, he did uh, defy racial barriers. He was O.J. before the allegations, before the trial. And then there were these deep separations uh, that, that, you know, we saw throughout the trial when it came to, to race. How did, that, how did that happen, and, and, and you know, what do you think about how this all played out during the trial? We talked to Alan Dershowitz uh, you know, last hour, and he said, yeah, we were aware of that. We actually utilized that in the trial when we were picking the jury. Yeah, and, and listen, let, let's talk about that trial. And you know, Ari will talk about it much better than me because that's his spiel. Uh, for the burden of proof for a, a prosecutor to make sure that all 12 people can prove beyond a reasonable doubt Defense has to just sway one person. That is a heavy burden. So when you walk into a case and when you are pre-screening your witnesses, you know the demons that you have with those witnesses and you have to decide whether to shoot the puck or not. So the debate is truth or justice. Because I can tell you, I have banker boxes for some of the homicide cases that I have that I know the truth is that there are people that are guilty, but if you don't have all of the evidence that's solid enough, you're going to get stuck. And, and this was a case you know, you know that the jury did not like Mark Furman. Right. You know that there are questions with the blood. And you know that you had some of the best witnesses, Dr. Henry Lee, who proved certain things that caused that burden of proof to be beyond reasonable doubt. And so it was the case had its flaws. But at the end of the day, the community wanted fairness, not justice, because they felt what happened a couple of years ago, which was ugly. Both cases were ugly. And, and I'll tell you, I'm not thrilled about the outcome of either of those cases. It bothers me. But again, that courtroom is where you have to make sure you have that beyond reasonable doubt burden of proof or else you wind up with these outcomes. It, we, we all remember, Ari, that, that famous moment, uh, you know, if the glove does not fit, you must acquit. Um, there were some blunders from the prosecutors, most notably the gloves. Uh, how do you think they handled the trial? And was it that moment that you thought, you think that where they lost it? I, I don't. I know that's been the one that's been documented so well. And, you know, Steve and Mark have made such fantastic points about Hertz and how O.J. viewed himself and burden of proof. They lost that trial before uh, that stupid move by Christopher Darden. I've read his book. He's a fine man. I bet you he's never had a good night's sleep since that verdict because he made the decision to pull the trigger on that and i'm sure uh, to his dying day he regrets it but that trial was essentially lost travis with a couple details that nobody ever talks about one that trial should have been in santa monica where the jury pool would have been more down the middle more towards where oj lived where he breathed where he worked where he existed they were so cocky with their case travis in terms of demographics that they moved it to downtown los angeles and for those again old enough to be me a jury consultant named joellen demetrius was brought in she was very famous back at the time who really understood how important a blunder that was of moving the trial to that jury pool you then add in that this was a jury that was sequestered which meant they were living together, not in public, not in today's day and age where we're all addicted to our stupid phones. This was a jury that was sequestered for so long that people forget how long it took them to come up with their verdict. And by long, I'm being sarcastic. Three hours. This was a jury that was never going to convict him. This was a defense team that really played on Mark Furman, who, quite frankly, if you know the details of this case, had a somewhat 
peripheral role here, but if you remember the N-word and the horrible things he said on that tape, mm -hmm. in the LA at that time, with the jury composed demographically as it was, to Mark's point, they would have had one person acquit, but quite frankly, they all acquitted, and I'm sure to their everlasting shame, we all know they let a guilty man go free. Um, Steve, last word to you on this before we run to break here. Uh, what was the mood like outside the courtroom? And, and when the verdict was read out, uh, what was that like? Well, I mean, we, it was a very strange, as, as you just heard, the, the jury came back after months and months and months of testimony. This was a very long trial. There, there's an old uh, theory that one week, one week of testimony equals one day of deliberations. This was less than four hours before the jury reached its verdict. The, the lawyers weren't even in town. That's why the verdict was announced the next day. So I don't think anyone really had any idea for sure. There were you know, people who claimed, oh, I know he's been found guilty. I know he's been found not guilty. I had people calling me on the phone that night. No one really knew. Uh, but it, when it was announced, there was, I think, shock because there was overwhelming evidence. Whether or not you felt he was guilty, there was overwhelming evidence pointing towards his guilt. And to have a jury come back that quickly was just remarkable. And that there was a division, sad to say, along racial lines. I always point out, I knew whites who thought he was not guilty. I knew blacks who thought he was guilty. But there was a large division along racial lines. And I thought that was the reaction. There were many in the black community who felt this was a bit of payback. Uh, maybe O.J. Simpson was guilty, but there have been many black men who were not guilty who have been convicted before, and this was a bit of payback. Uh, then there were white people who were just outraged. How could this happen? Well, they had not really uh, seen how blacks had been dealt in the justice system before. So it was a very remarkable reaction. And, you know, just people were gasping in the courthouse and in the press room where I was when it was announced. All right, uh, gentlemen, uh, stand by because we are going to dig a little bit deeper into what O.J. Simpson's legacy will be, the conversation around that, and also if the justice system all these years later has changed. Coming up, we'll meet you back at the intersection here on Canada Tonight. Stay with us. Welcome back to The Intersection here on Canada Tonight. In our story that we're focusing on today, O.J. Simpson, the man at the centre of what some call the trial of the century, who has died. Mark Saunders, Ari Golkin, Steve Futterman back with us. So, uh, gentlemen, we're going to focus on lessons learned and takeaways from all of this. Uh, Mark, we'll start with you. The LAPD came under such scrutiny and fire because of this trial, because of what was, uh, you know, really revealed to the world in terms of how this investigation went. What did the larger police community learn about crime protocols, crime scene protocols, uh, and just policing? Well, I think L.A. had some particular problems. I mean, there are a couple of high-profile cases that, that went the wrong way. I believe Robert Blake was someone, and then, of course, this case. Um, you know, it, it, in Toronto, what I like is when, when we have the opportunity of, I work homicide, and, you know, you have to make sure that that disclosure piece is, is readily available to the defense counsel. You have to make sure that your case is rock solid. And so having that strong relationship with the uh, Crown attorneys here, is something that's key. And if you don't feel you're going to meet that burden, you don't pull a trigger on it. You let it go, and you have to wait until you gather the evidence. But do not put the cart in front of the horse under any circumstance. And if you have doubt, then you have to go back to the drawing board and make sure you are as best protected as possible to have the best outcomes in trials. Hmm. Okay. Uh, Ari, in terms of the legal system, I asked Gloria Allred this, this question. Uh, and she said she doesn't think that there have been any changes to the judicial system. There's no, there's no lessons learned. Uh, and she worries still about uh, victims of domestic violence. What, what are your thoughts on if the judicial system in the United States has changed? I don't think it changed that much. I disagree with Gloria Allred about 98% of everything she says. On these 2% of things, let me tell you why she's so right. The one thing it did do is affect transparency. It really made sure that prosecutors in our country and south of the border were more transparent with their prosecutions. Just as Mark mentioned, disclosure. You didn't want to have a tape of Mark Furman rattling off um, vile epithets that would be found by a defense attorney like F. Lee Bailey. 
But let me pick up on an important point that Ms. Allred mentioned. It's the 1% where I agree with her and I think our politicians have failed. Travis, this show is called Tra Canada Tonight. Let's bring this back to the Ontario legislature just the other day. Mm -hmm. The NDP brought a motion that intimate partner violence sure. is still an epidemic in Ontario. The Doug Ford government, to their great credit, joined it. Now, how does that link to OJ? We still live in a country where if a woman is abused and doesn't have the means, she's not a socialite, she's not a Kardashian, pun intended to the case we're talking about. You can be somebody that comes to Canada with your iPhone and lots of money tonight and claims that you're a refugee. You'll get a shelter bed and a bed and breakfast. But if you're a woman who's being beaten up and abused in 2024, Travis, and you have kids and God forbid you have a dog, most shelters will turn you away. Most shelters will not let you come there with an animal or they are overcrowded because of what we're doing. So we have not learned a lesson from the O.J. Simpson case, which, as I said in the first segment, anybody who knows this case intimately was Nicole Brown Simpson on tape had said he's going to kill me. He's going to get away with it. And for years, see, she was subject, even though they were rich, to his violence. And in my view, Travis, we have not, in the last 30 years, addressed that problem appropriately. Hmm. I, I, I know what you're talking about in, the, in terms of the, the shelters. Some shelters don't allow people in with animals. That's what you're referring to, Ari. I just want to make that clear. Uh, Steve, race was such a central part of this case. Uh, how did it change the dialogue in and out of the courtroom uh, for, from you know, your perspective reporting on all of this? Well, I'll tell you one specific thing. When the trial began, there were going to be allegations of the N-word being used. And Christopher Darden would refuse to use that full word. Mm -hmm. That was the time I think the news media used it. We now refer to it as the N-word. We never use that word in full for the most part. There are rare exceptions. Before this trial, uh, if the N-word was used in full uh, as part of a quote or something, we would say it. But Chris Darden... I remember very clearly that these were in the early parts of the trial. He used that term, the N-word. And from that point on, I have rarely, if ever, heard the N-word said in full. Now, it did come up, obviously, in the Furman part of the case where he was accused of using it. And uh, F. Lee Bailey made it very clear he did use that N-word completely when he questioned uh, Mark Furman on the perjury aspect of the case. But that's one interesting aspect. I do think, though, that... Another way that we've, we've seen changes from this is even juries. This took the jury less than four hours. I think juries sometimes, especially right after the Simpson trial, were afraid to come back with a quick verdict. They would take their time. They would deliberate more. Jury foremen or four women knew about the criticism of the, the jury, and they sometimes said, let's talk about this. And I don't think there's anything wrong with that. Racially, uh, this is a still an issue. Are, are black defendants more likely to be convicted than white defendants, especially if they're poor? Sadly, I think the answer is still yes. But this raised all these issues. Uh, I think white America understood a bit more how black Americans had felt for so many years when black defendants who clearly were not guilty were railroaded and found guilty of, of ridiculous and, and very serious crimes. So I think it was an, an awakening for white America, what black America had gone through in the justice system. I think that was maybe a very important part of this case, whether you agree with the verdict or not. Last question to all of you, and Mark, I'll start with you, which is a simple one, but, but so complex. What will O.J. Simpson's legacy be? You know, hopefully there won't be a, a legacy of any kind. You know, I would tell you that uh, when I was in the Fugitive Squad, we had the opportunity of hosting the first ever Fugitive Squad conference with the U.S. Marshals. And the keynote speaker was Fred Goldman. And I had the opportunity of sitting down and talking with him. And there was a lot of pain. And, and he was very upset at the judicial system. But he was trying to hold on and be strong. And, you know, the overall thing is the, the bigger story, I think Ari Rose it, Rose it uh, earlier, was the fact that two innocent people did not deserve to die. Mm -hmm. um, their story has never been told fully. Instead, we're focusing on the villain of this, when in fact, we have a lot more work to do when it comes to the victimization and the things that we need to do in order to save people, rather than talk about them after they've succumbed 
to domestic violence. Yeah, and we can't forget about the victims, Ron Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. Ari, what, what's your uh, thoughts on, on all of this as we, as we, you know, end this chapter uh, of, of history talking about O.J. Simpson? It's, he's now dead. We close the book on a vile person, a person who lived an unenviable and disrespectful life. If you understand anything about how he lived his life, listen to his first wife. She'll tell you all about how he lived his life. When he met Nicole, he's a butcher. If you even take the verdict at its highest, then you look at how he lived his life after the verdict. He was glib. He was rude. He made fun of things. He tried to profit off things with insane, ridiculous books, If I Did It, and a stupid show called Juice that really disrespected the memories of Ron uh, Goldman and Nicole Brown Simpson. So you have to take the patina of celebrity. And as Steve uh, Futterman said so well about Hertz, if you take that off of him, he was just simply a vile killer, so different than most killers who sometimes have remorse. We're watching a trial in Toronto right now where an officer was killed and the person charged with it is on the stand literally today, Travis, crying and saying how bad he feels for it and apologizes for it to a jury. That's the opposite of O.J. Simpson, who to his last day was a monster and in my view, monstrous. And I hope he's six feet below and much further under that, given where he put Ron and Nicole. And, and finally, uh, last word to you, Steve. Uh, this was, a, you know, a big part of your uh, career uh, in journalism, covering these three O.J. Simpson trials. Uh, when you look back at that period and also uh, in terms of what his legacy will be in the conversation around that, uh, I, I wonder what your thoughts are. Well, he will be remembered by some as a Heisman Trophy winner. He'll be remembered by some as the first NFL running back to gain 2,000 yards in a, a season. He'll be remembered by some as the Hertz, Hertz pitch man. He'll be remembered by some as a, a, an actor who had some interesting bit roles in some funny movies. But in the end, I think many people will view him as a murderer who was found not guilty. I think that's going to be the legacy that he has for many, many, many people in North America. Gentlemen, we thank you for your time on this uh, very busy news night. That is our panel for tonight. Mark Saunders of Mark Saunders Consulting and former chief of police here in Toronto. Uh, lawyer Ari Goldkind and Steve Futterman, a reporter who covered OJ and his trials.